Robert Chagulani, a pop star turned politician who's known by the stage name Bobby Wine, is recognised as the new face of Uganda's opposition. But his rise to prominence has not been without its challenges. Bobby Wine's popularity is considered a threat to President Yoweri Museveni, who's been in office for more than 30 years. His government has arrested and prosecuted Bobby Wine several times, and the opposition figure has accused security forces of torturing him. But the 37-year-old is not holding back his ambition. In fact, he's now directly challenging President Museveni in elections expected to be held in 2021. But will his popularity be enough to get him elected? And what are his plans for the way forward? Uganda's Bobby Wine talks to Al Jazeera. Bobby Wine, leading opposition politician from Uganda. Thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. And let me start by asking you to tell us what's wrong with things in Uganda right now. I will try to be diplomatic and say many things are wrong, but if I was to be real, I would say almost everything is wrong, and uh, it all begins with leadership. We have um, what many people describe as a kleptocracy for a government, which we hope to make better. It's relatively recent that you've emerged on the political scene. Uh, you were, before that, a musician. Why did you decide to go into politics? I'm a musician. Um, social activist and a ghetto youth who recently, I call it recent but it's two years ago, um, decided to run and become a, a member of parliament. So was it a natural evolution from that to politics or was there a moment that made you decide to get involved in politics? I would say it was a natural evolution because initially, like any other young man, I was singing about the girls and the parties and everything. But, you know, over time, after realizing that indeed my music and my lyrics was influencing so many people, especially the young people, I decided to channel it to positivity and it was working well. However, there's this one time about 10 or something years ago when I got a personal attack. I was beaten uh, by my age mate and uh, my crime was showing off. That is a time when I had just gotten a brand new Escalade and uh, he claimed that I was showing off as if I didn't know that. Showing off a flash car. Showing off a flash car as if I did not know that the country actually had owners. That communicated so much about the injustices that so many people had been going through in my full glare and I decided to make injustice my enemy and that is when I started singing what now the regime calls political music, trying to address the, those injustices. However, um, I reached a time when I realized I could not keep just talking about them through my music and that's why I decided to get into actual politics so I could have a more formal platform in the parliament of Uganda to address these issues and that's what I've been doing. And you've been an MP for two years now, yeah, I've been but an MP the government's targeting of you has continued since you've been an MP. Not only is your music banned, your concerts banned, but you have faced attack. Tell me about the incident when your driver was killed. Well, I said it uh, the, the day I went to Parliament that since the Parliament refused to come to the ghetto, the ghetto will come to the Parliament. I wanted to articulate those issues that the regime, the, the government and those people that rule over us had ignored for a very long time. Of course, when I got into Parliament, it brought a lot of attention of the common people. They picked interest in the politics and indeed they started pushing me and suggesting that I run for president. Now, this infuriated uh, the president that we have who has for a long time been regarded as all-powerful and I started getting attacks and the most ferocious attack was the um, assassination attempt on my life in Arua which took the life of my driver instead of mine. And you were arrested after that? Yeah. What happened to you when you were in custody? You were tortured, well, yes? I was tortured, I was beaten and humiliated. You know, um, the regime uh, planted two machine guns on me and the spokesperson of the national police in Uganda actually came out and said those guns were found in my room only to withdraw the charges just a week later. That was in 2018. Yeah. This year, again, the attacks on you have continued? Well, the attacks on me have continued, but not only me. And I always say that I feel 
honored to see that my plight is highlighted, but this is the same plight that so many people are going through, or even worse, people that are unknown, people that you will never know about. And that is why every opportunity I get, I try to shine a light on their plight because I am only representative of what they are going through. The attacks have continued. I'm a musician, but my music has since effectively been banned in the country. I cannot stage any concert. I cannot be allowed to address a public gathering, not even in my constituency, which elected me to office. And yes, um, more than twice, uh, I went to church, and the church was tear-gassed by the regime because uh, President Museveni and the regime that uh, he presides over is so scared of anybody that communicates uh, words that open the eyes of the people of Uganda. Let's talk about President Museveni. Uh, you were, I believe, four years old when he came to power. Yeah. You probably, well, I'm sure, don't remember Uganda without Museveni, and that's a large part of the Ugandan population. Yeah, I'm 37, but I've never realistically experienced a Uganda with another president. And it is more than 80% of Ugandans that are in the same situation, you know, and that really gets us disturbed. We have been denied um, an opportunity to contribute to our country. We've been excluded as a new generation. And we desire to contribute to building a country which we know we are going to live in because certainly the people that are making decisions for us are not going to be there to either benefit or suffer from the decisions which are evidently wrong that they are making for us. If you look at the history of Uganda since independence from the colonial rulers, the British, it can really be summed up with three names, Milton Obote, Idi Amin, and Yuari Museveni. Now, two of those, Obote and Amin, Amin in particular, were very, very brutal. Would you accept that when Museveni came to power first, he rescued your country? Well, um, that has been said. We've always been hearing that while growing up until we grew up old enough to see with our own eyes. And I would say without fear of contradiction that Museveni's rule is much more brutal than the rules that have been there before. Only that President Museveni has been extremely smart and we must give it to him. You know, the world sees President Museveni and indeed many people describe him as a benevolent dictator or a dictator in a suit. To the Western world, President Museveni has always cast this image of a Democrat, but back home he has stepped on all rights and all freedoms and he has ruled Uganda um, with an iron fist. What do you say to international investors and to governments, to diplomats, who say, better the devil you know? Well, um, to the international community, to the international investors, and to all the organizations that are working with Uganda, first and foremost, I want to thank them for always choosing to be friends of Uganda. They've supported our healthcare system, and yes, they've supported our military. But we know that we are also citizens of the world, and what unites us should not be only business. It should be the values that we share together, values like democracy, values that the respect for human rights, and values like zero tolerance to corruption. So I request them to always hold the uh, administration accountable. Let them make the observation of human rights and the rule of law a precondition for cooperation with Uganda so that ultimately they are dealing with Uganda, not to the detriment of Ugandans. We want the international community and in particular the United States of America to be dealing with Ugandans and not with Museveni himself. Otherwise, um, the United States supports so much of our military uh, operations, especially in the fight against terror. But you see that the corruption that is ongoing in Uganda, and indeed the corruption of President Museveni himself, has caused that aid to again be used to repress the people. I've always noted that the gun that was used to extrajudicially execute my driver was an American gun. I've interviewed President Museveni three times. In fact, he's been on this program sitting in the chair where you are. He seems supremely confident. Do you think he's afraid at all of losing power? The only thing that President Museveni is scared of is losing power. And that is why today in Uganda, the major 
preoccupation of the government is the grip on power. It explains why President Museveni moves with stashes of money just bribing anybody. It explains why our police uh, force is reduced to now playing politics other than keeping law and order. It explains why the military, high-ranking military officials are coming out to denounce the po people or, or, or uh, the people power movement. The, the minister of uh, constitutional affairs is a, a soldier and he came out and said we shall fight people power using the military and air force. I mean, we are only young people that are not armed. We are only using words to assert what we want. And we're not even inciting violence. All we are saying is that we want to be regarded as human beings in, in our own home. So the desire to maintain the grip on power has made President Museveni descend down to unimaginable levels. The Constitution has been changed twice. It used to say that you're only allowed to be president for two terms. He's now done five terms. It used to say that you're only allowed to be president if you're younger than 75. He'll be 76 next time there is an election. What do you think is the president's plan? Do you think he plans to rule until he dies or do you think he plans uh, to hand over power to his son or maybe his wife? Well, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't want to say I think. I would want to say I know that President Museveni plans to rule for life and maybe after he dies in office probably he wants his son or his wife to take after him which is wrong which is unacceptable which we are going to fight until the end because Uganda is not a monarch Uganda is a democracy and all Ugandans should be um, included in the governance of Uganda but most importantly it should be the people of Uganda to make the decision you may, you talked about our constitution yes our constitution used to provide for that but still our constitution although it has been um, changed so many times the constitution as it is provides for fundamental rights it provides for the freedom of association it provides for the freedom of speech and all these freedoms are being stepped on um, we, recently, it was on international TV when Dr. Kiza Besige was brought lies. He's a political opponent. And myself, I'm a political opponent to President Museven, but I cannot be allowed to address any crowd anywhere. I cannot even be allowed to access radio or TV stations, especially in the countryside. Why? Because President Museveni is very, very scared of the message that we bring. He's very scared of the fact that 85% of um, the population of Uganda is my age and younger. He's very scared because he see the signs everywhere. People are yearning for change. What about his own party, the National Resistance Movement? Do you think he's got trouble inside the party too? Well, it's very evident that President Museveni has trouble in the party itself. I mean, even in the People Power Movement, we are working with more than 10 members of parliament uh, who actually belong to the ruling party, but they see the truth because the truth is constantly being told them by their voters they want change. So I believe that the, the, the wind of change is blowing even in President Museveni's bedroom. Perhaps the most important quote ever from President Museveni came in his first year in office when he wrote a book, What's Africa's Problem? May I quote? from that. The problem of Africa in general, and Uganda in particular, is not the people, but leaders who want to overstay in power. Now, I picked him up on that quote when I spoke to him six years ago in 2013 on this programme, and he said, no, 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 staying in power without elections. I'm in power because of elections. And he has been repeatedly re-elected. President Museveni used to say those things when he was around my age. 34 years later, he doesn't want to hear what he said when he was st still, in my opinion, sober. So there's only one explanation for that. Power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. There have been allegations that previous elections were not free and fair. In your view, right now, is President Museveni the legitimate president of Uganda? Well, I'm very convinced that Dr. Kiza Besige won the previous elections. And I would believe that uh, even if Museveni could have won the, the past elections, the way he's handling uh, the people of Uganda makes him lose his legitimacy. However, we are looking at the opportunity of 2021 for the Ugandans to assert their voices, which we are sure they are going to. 
Do you see a trend in Africa? I mean, look, for example, at Zimbabwe. Um, look uh, in other parts, in, in North Africa, at, at Algeria, for example. Do you see a trend that older leaders are now being forced to give up power? Well, the wind of change is blowing. It's only those that have decided to cover their ears and eyes that don't see it. But the wind of change is blowing. Those of us who were young are now grown. We were babies, now we are parents. We are demanding the right to shape the future for ourselves and our children, and we'll stop at nothing. This is not only happening in Uganda. It is happening all over Africa. You've seen what happened in Burkina Faso in the past, in Algeria, and um, now what happened recently in Sudan. It is happening in Uganda. You've mentioned the demographics in your country and how many people are young under 35. Because of your music and your own age, tell me what the youth of Uganda are saying. The youth of Uganda are saying they want better. The youth of Uganda are saying they want their country back. The youth of Uganda are saying they want a country that offers equal opportunity to every Ugandan where somebody uh, is going to be judged by the content of their character, not which tribe they come from, not who their parents are. The youth of Uganda are saying it is time, it is our time. And the next election is 2021. Yes, please. You say that you're going to stand for president. Yes. Will you get all of the opposition to come behind you as the one unified candidate against President Museveni? Well, it is our effort. We are in advanced stages um, discussing with different leaders from different uh, groupings and different um, formations to see that we come together as the opposition well knowing that one big challenge we all face is the oppression and the limited or shrinking uh, political space. Given that shrinking political space and the history of the previous elections, the five presidential elections we've seen which Museveni has won, he has a very tight grip on the system and there have been persistent allegations of vote rigging. How do you overcome that if he rigs the election? Yeah, we know that President Museveni is planning to rig the election. He has done that in the past. Recently he did it in Hoima in a by-election using the military. But we are banking on overwhelming him because a vote can easily be rigged if it's not overwhelming. And ultimately if President Museveni tries to rig the election than he has been like he has been doing then the people of Uganda will rise up and they will stop it. Well let me ask you about what you mean by that because if you are blocked at the ballot box what other ways will you seek to remove Museveni and it's worth noting to our viewers that since independence in the 1960s there has never been a peaceful transfer of power in Uganda. The law as it is today permits me to vie for presidency and if President Museveni tries to stop me from vying for the presidency, that would be another bridge that we shall cross when we get there. But what you said a moment ago, that the people could rise up. Are you yeah. saying there could be an armed revolution against Museveni if your efforts at the ballot box are blocked? I did not say people could rise up. I said people will raise up because that is evident everywhere. They are tired of this oppression and they will not take it any longer. I do not believe in violence. So we are using and shall continue to use all legitimate and legal ways of defending our voice. I was speaking to one international diplomat who's actually met you, who says, Bobby Wine, he's a performer, he's very charismatic, but what does he know about running a country? What are going to be your policies if you get rid of President Museveni? We are looking at breaking a dictatorship and uh, having Uganda under civilian rule, which has never happened before. We want the voice of the people to surpass the voice of the guns. Um, we want to return the rule of law and dignity to the Ugandans and utmost respect for human rights. We want to revive our education system. I mean, it is sad that uh, the wife of the president, whose education is actually questionable, is the minister of education and uh, it is so sad, uh, the recent happenings in Makere University and what she said, but uh, that explains the regime and the family and the couple that's ruling over us. We want to revive our healthcare system. It is sick itself. Um, it explains why our government 
uh, officials, our leaders actually never go to our hospitals. Even when they have to give birth, they fly to countries, to developed countries for treatment, while the Ugandans are left to suffer and die. That explains why we lose more than 19 women every day, not every week, not every month, but every day giving birth. More than 300 children die in Uganda, you know, and all these other um, challenges that people go through. If we had a functioning healthcare system, it would be working. Uganda is enormously gifted with amazing fertile soils. However, the land has been conspicuously owned by one family or one clan or one grouping. We want to put an end to that. We want the natural resources of the country to be actually a property and a benefit of the people of Uganda. We are greatly endowed with natural resources from minerals to oil. We want them to facilitate the people of Uganda and help develop us. And finally, we want to unite our country because we live in a deeply divided country divided along, along ethnicity, along class, along income, along political lining. We want to put an end to that, and that will uh, need us to have a truth and, and reconciliation program that can bring our people together so we can have a, 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 a foundation that will take us together uh, forward as a country. And most importantly, I know that many of our very resourceful, knowledgeable, educated, and intelligent people have been forced to leave Uganda because the nation does not offer what they deserve. These are first world brains stuck in a third world country. We want to repatriate them back home to help build our country. I must note that after the unfortunate events in Rwanda of 1994, it is mainly Ugandans that went to Rwanda and assisted build the Republic of Rwanda. We want Ugandans living in America, living um, in Europe, living elsewhere to feel comfortable and blessed to come back and rebuild their country. Currently, so much of the system was built by and is loyal to Museveni, particularly the security apparatus. What do you do about that, about if you were in charge, about the police, the army, the courts? Where do you draw the line of who you remove from their jobs? I've been communicating um, to the men and women in uniform, telling them that this is a fight for them too. We're not fighting against them, we're fighting for them. They deserve dignity. These are men and women who spend sleepless nights trying to keep us safe. But again, looking at uh, how they live, how their children survive, how they are enumerated, uh, um, it is sad. So we want to better their life so that our security is better. We want the police not to be playing politics, but to be doing their uh, mandatory work, which is uh, protecting people and their property. We want our soldiers to be dignified, to earn well, and to live well. And would you continue keeping those soldiers playing a regional role? For example, Somalia. Uganda's had soldiers there for 12 years. Yes, you get paid a lot of money by the US government for having your soldiers as part of AMISOM, but should Uganda be fighting the US's wars? Uganda, in my opinion, is not fighting the US's wars. I believe that Africa is our home. I believe that we should be our brother's keepers. So whenever there's a problem, Uganda, like all other nations, should be part of it. You know, But again, just like we are trying to uh, have stability and harmony in other countries, uh, it should not be at the cost of Ugandans. So Ugandans should benefit from the stability as well. That should not come at the cost of Ugandans. My final question. How worried are you about the stakes in what you're doing here? Because in two years' time, yes, you could be the president of Uganda, but you could also be in jail. You could be in exile, or it could be worse. Yeah, I know that every day that I live, I live it as if it's my last day. Every time I leave home, my little daughter hugs me and makes me promise 100 times that I will come back home. I always want to go back home. I have a little beautiful family. I have a young, beautiful wife, and we always promise each other that we'll work so hard in our youthful days and retire early and enjoy our lives. I want to live peacefully like any other Ugandan. But this is very important because it is not life if one is not living free. So I know the stakes are high. I know the regime is bent at nothing 
um, to keep power, even eliminating people like myself. And I know, I've been told before, that there's a very big uh, target on my life. I know that is there, but I also know that it is worth it to fight for freedom even at the point of death. I've said it before and I'll say it again that we shall continue to fight legally and constitutionally for our freedom and if need be, we shall die fighting for our freedom. Bobby Wine, thank you for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much for having me.